Washington, D.C. might become the 51st state if a controversial new bill can make it past Republicans in the Senate. Welcome to America Uncovered, I'm Chris Chappell. America might be getting its 51st state. Sadly, it's not Canada. One day, Canada, one day, as soon as we find a way past your moose. Last week, the House of Representatives passed H.R. 51, a bill that might turn Washington, D.C. into the 51st state. The Biden administration is all for it. In a White House statement, the administration calls for the Congress to provide for a swift and orderly transition to statehood for the people of Washington, D.C. Turning D.C. into a new state is a big deal. Not just because it might mean we all need to buy new flags. Look, I'm not made of money. I'll probably just add a sticker to mine. It's a big deal because it's a hugely partisan battle. It was a party-line vote which means that almost all Democrats in the House of Representatives voted for it, while almost all Republicans voted against it. The exceptions were two Democrats and four Republicans who didn't vote at all. And some are saying this battle is rooted in racism. Is there anything in this country that's not a partisan battle rooted in racism? Pancakes. Pancakes aren't racist, right? What's that, Shelley? Oh. Right. So why is D.C. statehood so controversial? I'll explain after the break. Welcome back. Unless YouTube demonetized us again, then that was really awkward, which is why we rely on viewers like you. You can support the show for as little as a dollar an episode on the crowdfunding website Patreon. So you might be wondering, why isn't D.C. a state? Well, there's a reason. Throughout the history of the United States, there's been this push and pull between the power of state governments and the federal government. The Founding Fathers didn't want the country's capital to be a state because that state and its residents would have way more power than any other. And so a chunk of Maryland and Virginia were separated out to become Washington District of Columbia. At the time, there were about 3,000 people living in D.C., too few to become a state. Today, however, there are more than 700,000 people that live in D.C. That's more than the states of Wyoming and Vermont. And yet, because D.C. is not a state, those 700,000 do not have any senators or representatives in Congress. Well, technically they do have one representative, Congresswoman Ellen Norton. But although Congresswoman Norton is allowed to sponsor bills and serve on congressional committees, she can't vote on most bills. So D.C. residents still don't have an actual vote in Congress. They do still pay taxes, though, which explains Washington, D.C.'s incredibly salty license plate motto, end taxation without representation. It's just like the Boston Tea Party. But instead of dumping tea into the Boston Harbor, you protest by going to the DMV. Yeah voluntarily going to the DMV. That shows you just how upset D.C. residents are about their lack of voting rights. In fact, D.C. residents weren't even allowed to vote for the president until 1961, when the 23rd Amendment passed. Today, Congress still controls D.C.'s local legislation, which means that it can block or overturn decisions that D.C. residents want. Many say that D.C. residents are essentially being treated as second-class citizens. But the residents of D.C. are United States citizens. The residents of D.C. pay more than their fair share in taxes. Therefore, the residents of Washington, D.C. should be able to have representation in our United States Congress so they can be a part of the voices to guide our public policy. H.R. 51 would change all of this. Now, the creation of a federal district that's not part of any state, is in the Constitution. That can't be changed without an amendment to the Constitution, which is not easy to do. It requires approval from two-thirds of Congress and three-fourths of the states. 
But HR51 proposes something a little different. Oh, HR51, 51 states, I get it. Boy, those people in Congress sure are clever. I mean, not clever enough to get us out of endless wars and crippling national debt, but they've got a great sense of humor. That's why Senator Mitch McConnell's congressional nickname is Chuckles. Anyway, here's what HR 51 proposes. The federal district itself doesn't become a new state. Instead, the bill shrinks the size of federal territory to just federal buildings and monuments where almost no one actually lives. Okay, some people would live there. Meanwhile, the rest of the District of Columbia, where 700,000 people live, becomes a new state. It would be called Washington Douglas Commonwealth in honor of abolitionist Frederick Douglass. The federal territory itself would be renamed the Capitol, like something out of the Hunger Games, which, in terms of branding, is not the best idea. Okay, if they start combining states into numbered districts, I'm out of here. The new state, Washington Douglas Commonwealth, would get to vote for two senators and a House representative. But there are still some major obstacles to H.R. 51. Pretty much the same bill passed the House last year, but it didn't pass the Senate. That's because the Senate was controlled by Republicans. And as I said, this is an extremely partisan issue, which I'll get to in a moment. But today, the Democrats control the Senate. To pass, the bill needs 51 votes. If 48 Democrats and two independents vote together, and all 50 Republicans vote against, Vice President Kamala Harris will be the tiebreaker. But that doesn't mean it's a done deal. A handful of moderate Democratic senators have yet to signal how they would vote. Or Republican senators can filibuster. Essentially, that lets Republicans block a vote on the bill. And if you can never vote on a bill, it never passes. You can stop a filibuster if you get 60 Senate votes. So D.C. state advocates would need to find at least 10 Republicans who'd vote for statehood. Filibusters are supposed to be a way to force bipartisan cooperation, one that's not too popular with Democrats now that they're the majority. That's another episode, though. So why are Democrats for D.C. statehood? And why are Republicans so against it? I'll tell you after this final commercial break. Welcome back. So there's a pretty obvious reason why Republicans are against turning D.C. into a state. Republicans make up only 6% of the district's registered voters. So this new state's senators and representative would most likely be Democrats. Not only that, but the 23rd Amendment still gives three electoral votes to the federal district. But H.R. 51 would leave the federal district with nearly no residents outside of the White House. I wonder how he would vote. Okay, realistically, there would be a few more residents than just the White House. But the combined electoral votes of the Capitol and the new state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth would mean the Democrats just got a lot more power. H.R. 51 attempts to get around this issue by expediting a joint resolution in Congress to repeal the 23rd Amendment. That's the one that gives the federal district three electoral college votes. Repealing an amendment is a long process that requires Congress and state legislatures. But theoretically, it could be done before the next presidential election. So the federal district would no longer get any extra electoral college votes. But Democrats would still gain an extra two Senate seats from D.C. statehood, which would give them a lot more power in the Senate. So for partisan reasons, many Republicans don't want to give D.C.'s 700,000 residents congressional voting rights. And here's where it gets really dicey. 46% of the population of D.C. is black. So there's kind of this whole Republicans denying black people the right to vote vibe going on. For example, House Oversight Committee Chair Carolyn Maloney says Republicans would rather deny voting rights for hundreds of thousands of American citizens than even consider the possibility that representatives from the new state could be Democrats. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser says D.C. statehood is a civil rights and a voting rights issue. In fact, opposing D.C. statehood may actually prove that you're a bigot and a white supremacist. 
The truth is there is no good faith argument for disenfranchising over 700,000 people, most of whom are people of color. Uh, these desperate objections are about fear. Fear that in DC their white supremacist politics will no longer play. Fear that soon enough white supremacist politics won't work anywhere in America. Fear that if they don't rig our democracy, they will not win. There certainly is a history of denying black people voting rights in America. For instance, black men were given the right to vote in Washington, D.C. in 1867. At the time, they made up a third of D.C.'s population, so they established themselves in local government. Congress responded by dismantling that government through new laws in 1871 and 1874 that gave the president, whom D.C. residents still couldn't vote for, the sole power to appoint D.C. leaders. Hmm. A little more recently, in 1972, John Rarick, the Democratic House Representative of Louisiana, warned that any measure giving the district power to govern itself could lead to a takeover by the black Muslims. So is any resistance to D.C. statehood a result of either partisan bickering or white supremacy? Well, say it with me, things are more complicated. H.R. 51 would shrink the federal district to only federal buildings. That ignores the fact that a federal enclave could not function as a self-contained entity. In other words, the federal government is interconnected with the entire district's sewer systems, water systems, roads, fire department, and police force. All those things would be under the jurisdiction of the new state of Washington, D.C. The federal government would start depending on a single state in order to do basic functions. Representative Andrew Clyde, a Republican, points out that if D.C. became a state, it could simply refuse to protect the federal buildings from violent protesters. That was a concern of the Founding Fathers. And it wasn't theoretical. In June 1783, a drunken mob of unpaid Continental Army soldiers surrounded the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. State and local authorities in Pennsylvania refused Alexander Hamilton's desperate pleas to defend the Congress. We don't want one state having outsized power over the federal government. That is why D.C. was set aside as an entire city, not just federal buildings. And there's another problem with H.R. 51. It may be unconstitutional for Congress to create a D.C. state through just legislation. This is something the U.S. Justice Department has warned against. The Justice Department in 1987 wrote that D.C. statehood should be vigorously opposed because it is inconsistent with the language of the Constitution and brings up a lot of troubling questions. And you might think, well, of course it did. The Justice Department in 1987 was under a Republican administration. But this is actually something that has bipartisan agreement. Every Justice Department that has addressed the question, from the Kennedy administration to the Bush administration, has concluded that the Constitution does not allow for legislative alteration of Washington, D.C.'s status. So even if H.R. 51 passes the Senate and gets signed into law by President Biden, it will likely face a constitutional challenge at the Supreme Court. But there's another option. A Republican senator has introduced a bill that would redraw state lines so most people living in D.C. would be in Maryland. That way, they'd have the right to vote. And since there's no new state, there's no new Democratic positions in Congress. So it's a great compromise, right? Except for some reason, Democrats aren't as fond of this idea. Go figure. So what do you think about D.C. becoming a new state? Let me know in the comments below. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.